Uh, we're going to look at Romans chapter 3, verses 3 and 4 to start with. And the title of the message would be, Let God Be True and Every Man a Liar. Um, I want us to look at the Word of God as truth and man as a liar. And um, base what man says on what the Word of God says. Does it line up? Romans chapter 3, verse 3. For what if some did not believe, shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Paul writes in verse 3, For what if some of them did not believe? Not all the Jews under the gospel of the kingdom believed that message of the gospel, that Christ was a Messiah. Not all the Jews believed that. And today in the dispensation of grace, not all people believe the death, burial, and resurrection for salvation. And Paul says, shall their unbelief uh, destroy the word of God and make it a non-effect? That's what Paul is saying. And so, shall their unbelief nullify the grace and the promises of God? In, this, in, in their respective dispensations. Paul was preaching to this dispensation, the gospel of grace, where Peter was preaching the gospel of the kingdom in the, uh, under the law. Of course, we know that that dispensation has now ended, and God's dealing with man today through the dispensation of grace with the message of death, burial, and the resurrection for salvation. And he says, Shall their unbelief make the faith of God a non effect, or stop God's work of redemption and God's plan for man? No, it will not stop it. In no way can man's unbelief stop the faithfulness of God. God is faithful to do what he said he's going to do. And nothing man does or says can stop what God is going to do according to his will and purpose. And God is faithful to all who believe the gospel of grace. His faithfulness is what saves us when we trust in the death of burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the only way to heaven, my friends, is by putting your faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And without that, there is no salvation. And if you try to work your way to heaven by church membership or, or good deeds or good works, it's going to, uh, in the end, end up in destruction of your soul in hell and the lake of fire. And so a man must come to the realization that Christ died on the cross for his sins. And died and shed his blood that we could have eternal life when we by faith put our trust in that blood alone and nothing else. Our, our salvation is not based on what we do. But it's on what Christ did. What the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did on that cross for us. Now, unbelieving men today, they reject the grace of God. They reject salvation by grace and want to add works to that salvation. You say you've got to repent of your sin to be saved. First, you've got to turn from sin to be saved. It's what the, uh, the, the, the false preachers say. Turn from your sin, then get saved. Well, you can't turn from your sin until you first get saved. After you get saved, then God gives you the Holy Spirit, and you have that ability in you to turn from sin and to live a righteous and holy life as you learn God's Word. Now, the Word of God is faithful to those who believe the Word of God. To be saved. And God says, shall the man's unbelief make the word of God an unaffect? It's not going to change it, but, but God's faithful in his word to, to save us when we put our trust in what Christ did for us. Now, the unsaved man, the word of God is faithful to him too. It's because God says, if you reject my son and his death on the cross, then you're going to pay for your own sin. And God's faithful in saying that, that, that if you don't trust me as your Savior, you're going to die and go to hell and pay for your own sin. To go to hell, you've got to stumble over the cross and trample on the foot the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when Christ was crucified, those Roman soldiers... We're standing next to the Savior. And his blood was pouring out his body. 
And no doubt, as those soldiers crucified Christ, they were walking under the blood and that was falling on their uniforms and on their hands and on their feet. And they trampled under the foot the blood and mercy of grace. And every person today who rejects Christ's salvation is guilty as those Roman soldiers who trampled under the foot the blood of Christ. And Paul says, so their unbelief make the, 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 of God the non effect. No, it will not. In verse 4, Paul answers the question, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? He says, God forbid, let God be true and every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 and 6. He says, Though I speak with the tongues of men, and angels, and have not charity. I am become as a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. He says, if I have not charity. Charity is the love of God here for lost souls. And he says in verse 6, Charity, the love of God in us for lost souls, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. The grace of God does not rejoice in iniquity. God shed his grace on us at Calvary, and his grace teaches us to live a holy life and a righteous life after we're saved. We can't live a holy life. We cannot live a righteous life until we first put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who paid our sin debt. And he says, don't rejoice in sin. Don't rejoice in people's iniquity. And, and, and that applies to us as a Christian. We need to hate our sin. Sometimes we get sin in our life, and we need to learn to hate sin when it's present in our life so that we can repent of our sin and turn to Christ and live a holy life. Grace teaches you to live a holy life. Grace doesn't teach you liberty to go out and commit sin, but it teaches you to live a holy life and a righteous life. God tells us the truth all the time. He loves us too much to lie and sugarcoat our sin when sin is in our life. And God is faithful in his word to do what he said he'll do. How do you know truth? There's so many uh, different preachers out there today preaching different doctrines. How do you separate one doctrine from one preacher's theology from another preacher's doctrine? There's so many, there, there's what, I think 26 different Baptists I heard at one time. So they all got different doctrines. But how do you know whose doctrine is true? And the only way you know a person's doctrine or a preacher's doctrine is true is by what the, the Word of God says. And you got to line up what he says with the Word of God. And if you can't confirm what that preacher's saying as truth, then you need to find another church and another pastor. Your pastor should line up with what this Bible says, what a King James Bible says. Not just any Bible, but a King James Bible. The King James Bible is the standard of our truth. And that's how we judge truth today is what the King James Bible says. One thing about the King James Bible It has the blood of martyrs on it. You will go back to William Tyndale. He's one of my heroes of faith, William Tyndale. Translated the Bible into English from the Texas Receptus text. And from William Tyndale, the King James Bible was born. 85% of the King James Bible is word for word, William Tyndale. And William Tyndale translated the Bible into English for us that we could have a way of knowing what God's word says and what is truth. And the Catholic Church hates King James Bible. They hate the true word of God. And they hunted William Tyndale down, tied him to a stake, and strangled him to death, and then burned his body at the stake for translating the word of God. And they said, if you will recant your translation, we'll spare your life. And he said, I'll not do that. May the uh, eyes of the King of England be open to the word of God, is what William Tyndale said before they killed him. And so 
his translation is in the King James Bible. And, and I thank God for William Tyndale. He's one of my heroes. We all need heroes. But you need godly heroes. You don't need a rock star hero or some little guy running down a football field with a piece of leather under his arm. They ain't no hero about that. And they're getting millions of dollars for doing that kind of junk. There's no salvation in that. You need the right kind of heroes. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and 19. Paul writes, he says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he be not wise, that he may be wise. We need to be truthful to, truthful to ourselves and to God. And, and I, if we get wise in our own conceit, we try to hide our sin and say, I have no sin in my life. I don't need God. But we need to be truthful and admit that we need Christ. Always, even after we're saved, we still need Christ because he's in us and we're in Christ. And then he says in verse 19, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And then he says in verse 20, And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Now this word vain here doesn't mean that uh, it's, uh, it's uh, words that don't mean anything. You know, we, you know how we talk sometimes just like junk. We just talk junk sometimes that don't have no meaning to it. That's not what he means here, vain talk. He's talking about wrong teaching, wrong doctrine. The wise man, the foolish man, he's got his own mind made up and he's got his own foolish doctrine about God and about the Bible. And, and, and Paul is warning us against those who have wrong doctrine and, and vain uh, thoughts about the Word of God. He said, The vain thoughts of the wise and the foolish of the world come from a man's heart. In other words, a lost man or a man that rejects the Word of God, he's, he's wise in his own wisdom and he's got his own thoughts about the Bible. And, and, and that's in his heart, the false doctrine. And what is in his heart is going to come out in his words, in his actions, in his deeds. And Paul warns us against these people. And, and uh, he said that, that God will take the foolish man in his own craftiness, his own deceit. He'll, he'll one day have to pay for his denying the word of God and denying the doctrines of truth. And if he doesn't get saved, he'll go to hell and think about that all his time in hell, you know. If a man speaks lies and you know he's lying, if, he feeds, if, he, if he's preaching false doctrine and you know it's false, then you know he's a foolish man, an unwise man of the world. If he speaks the truth, if a man speaks the truth and you know it's the truth, you know it's the truth because you've lined his words up with what the Word of God says, not what I think or you think. In fact, I'm up here speaking now. You need to consider that everything I say is a lie until it lines up with the Word of God. And any preacher you listen to, don't care who it is, Consider his words on truth until they match the word of God, rightly divided and studied. <laughs> this flesh of ours is weak and unprofitable. And we're all subject to lie at times and, and to do things that are wrong. Not just lying, but whatever it might be. Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our flesh is weak. We're not strong enough to resist the devil. The only way we can resist the devil is to have the word of God in our heart and in our life and trust Christ to fight that battle for us. This is, it's a spiritual war going on constantly between our flesh and the, and, and the spirit. And the devil is trying to influence our flesh. And we need to let the Holy Spirit fill us with God's grace and mercy that we can withstand the fiery darts of Satan. <laughs> we need to understand that, that Christians can lie. And sometimes sinners can tell the truth. 
A lost man can tell the truth at times. But just because we're saved don't mean we can, we're not subject to be a liar at times. But we need to guard our thoughts and our minds so that when we do speak, that we don't lie. And just because a preacher is preaching from a pulpit or teaching does not mean he's telling you the whole truth. He does his words line up with what the Word of God says? Judges words by the Bible, the King James Bible. Let God, let, let God through the Bible tell us what truth is. And that truth involves our doctrine, what we believe doctrinally about salvation, and eternal security, and the virgin birth, and all the, the fundamentals of the faith. Truth matters more than who the man is. Don't follow a man. Follow the Word of God. Is the Word of God true or is the man true? The Word of God's true if it's a King James Bible. You take a, a modern translation, it's corrupt. It's got errors in it. It's got untruth in it. So how do you know what's true and what's not true when you're using a modern translation? You don't know because if you, if you look at a church, you look at a church and on their statement of faith, they'll have something like this. We believe the Bible to be in air in the original language. Well, what they're saying is they don't believe they have a Bible today that's not corrupt. They believe the Bible they have has errors in it. And it's got mistakes in it. My Bible has no errors, no mistakes. It's in the inerrant word of God, preserved by God. If God can't preserve his word, then we don't have a Bible today. And so... God has preserved his word through the King James Bible in English. And, and, and I'll go to task against these guys that say that the King James is wrong and that their Bible is right, though it does have errors in it. And they'll admit it has errors in it, mistakes in it. I don't know the verse offhand. But you take the new King James Bible, it teaches, it says, we are being saved. In other words, you're not saved. You're being saved. The King James says you are saved. Two different translations. One is a false King James Bible. And the other is the true King James Bible. The King James says that we are saved. We're not being saved. Being saved is the Catholic doctrine. And if you use the modern Bible, you're using a Catholic Bible in essence. You need to study where the modern translations came from. They came from corrupt documents and manuscripts out of Alexandria, Egypt. And our Bible came from Antioch where men were first called Christians. <laughs> Ephesians 6, excuse me, Ephesians 5, verse 6 through uh, 9, or through 8. <laughs> Paul writes, said, Let no man deceive you with vain words. And there's that word vain again. Let no man deceive you with, with false doctrine. That's what he's talking about here. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Don't partake of teachers who teach false doctrine. Don't let them control your life. He says, be not partakers with them. Now, he's not talking about, uh, a lot of people want to say, well, they will don't, don't, don't associate with people that sin. But he's talking about doctrine here. And, and if you're in a church that's teaching false doctrine, you need to get out of it and find you a Bible-believing, hopefully, mid-Acts 9 church, if you can find one. <laughs> For you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light. The Lord walk a light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. We're to walk in the truth and the doctrines that this Bible teaches us. Not in the wisdom of men. Paul says, don't be takers of their false doctrine. And Paul's making our Christian walk and our Christian beliefs a command. It's not, it's not a suggestion. He says, do not fellowship with false doctrine. 
In verse 9, he says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in, is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. The Spirit of God does not lie or lead us away from righteousness or holiness. We are to be truth tellers, truth bearers, ambassadors of Christ to a lost and dying world. And we can only do that as we learn the Word of God in a King James Bible, rightly divided and studied. And some of you know that, that I am a retired DeKalb County police officer. And I had 25 years of service with DeKalb County. And during my time as a police officer, I'd had to go to court many times. And the bailiff would take a Bible and he says, put your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth so help you God? And I'd say, I do. And I did tell the truth. Proverbs 25, 18 says, A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul and a sword and a sharp spear. A maul is a wooden hammer, big wooden hammer. A big heavy wooden hammer and a spear and a sword can kill a man. And seriously injure him. And same, and he's comparing those instruments and weapons of war with false testimony. He says uh, a, a false testimony in court can kill and destroy the innocent man and his family. You deprive an innocent man of his family and with a false witness, and you destroy that man's and that family's stability to exist and to live and to be provided for. A lie is a dangerous weapon and it injures and destroys relationships and kills people, or it can. And so he's saying false doctrine is a lie and false doctrines destroy souls of men and women and boys and girls. So we need to know right doctrine and Stay in right doctrine and not be attended to those who present false doctrine to us. The written word of God tells the truth and it should be trusted in the foundation of our Christian life. If the word of God you hold in your hands is truth, it has no error in it. But if you hold a Modern translation in your hand, you're holding a Bible that has errors in it. Where are the errors? You got to search them out and find them. But how do you know you've got to search them? How do you know you got the right error when you don't know if it's true or not? <laughs> Remember the wisdom of man is foolish and vain. First Corinthians three twenty he says, And again the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Remember 1 Corinthians 3.19, remember he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. For the words of man to be true, they must line up with God's word. And they'll be judged by God's word one day as to truth or error. If a, if a man is saved and he's preaching false doctrine, he's going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for that doctrine that he taught his congregation. And that's a scary thought to to know that you've got to stand before God and give an account for what you did with the Word of God. Let's turn over to 2 Timothy 2, 16. Verse 16 through 19. <clears throat> Paul says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. False doctrine is going to lead you into sin. It's not going to lead you into righteousness and holiness. And he goes on and says, and their, and their word will eat as doth a canker. A canker is a worm that eats the fields, the crops in the field. It devours the crops, destroys the crops. And false doctrine is like a canker worm. It destroys gradually the doctrine that's truth. It gradually destroys it if you've got false doctrine mixed in with it. And Paul warns us against that. And he says, a canker worm of whom is Hymaeus and Philippius. He's comparing these two men to a canker worm. 
So any preacher that's preaching false doctrines is nothing but a canker. He's like a worm that destroys what God wants you to know is right and true. He says, nevertheless, excuse me, I'm sorry, at verse 18, who concerning the truth have erred. These two men have erred. They, fought, they taught false doctrine, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. If a man's not granted in the word of God, he's subject to hear false doctrine and fall for it. In verse, uh, John uh, 17, 17, Christ said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. If you say that the word of God is not true, you're calling Jesus Christ a liar. And man, that, that's, that's a dangerous place to be. That's a dangerous statement to make, to call Jesus Christ himself a liar. He said, thy word is truth. John 1.1 1, 1 and 1.14 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we, and we beheld the glory as the only begotten uh, of the Father, full of grace and truth. Tyndale translates that last part of that verse. Which word was full of grace and truth? God's word is full of grace and truth, abounding truth, abounding grace. We, we don't realize how much grace and truth is in the word of God. It's more than we can comprehend. So the word of God is full of grace and truth. It does not have one lie or one error in it. The word of the Lord is in thy mouth if we believe the word of God. And today we need to ask the question, where do we get the word of God? Where do we get truth? What version of the Bible are you supposed to use? To get truth. We can only find truth in the King James Bible. There's, there's over, uh, if I remember, over a thousand different translations of the Word of God in the English language. And the only reason they're doing that is they got copyrights on them. Well, one reason they're doing it is they got copyrights on those words. And so they're selling copyrighted versions, false versions for money. They're not, they're not doing it to edify God and bring lost men to Christ. They're doing it for filthy lucre. If you've got a thousand versions, they don't all say the same thing. You could have 300 different opinions out of those thousand verses of, of translations on one verse in the Bible. William Tyndale and the King James Bible do not contradict each other. Now, Tyndale's 15% that's different than the King James does not contradict what the King James writers put down. So I could read a Tyndale Bible and a King James Bible, and I'd have no contradiction. But you take a modern translation, lay it beside the King James, and read it, you're going to find contradictions and different different. Uh, Doctrines are being taught. In fact, if you go to Mark chapter 16 and look at it, the last 12 verses in the modern Bible are missing in the modern translations. If they are there, they put a footnote saying these don't belong. The, the, the best manuscripts don't have it. That's what they put. And then I think there's 57 verses missing in the modern translations that the King James has. Romans 3, 4 says that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. The words we speak must be true and right and line up with the King James Bible. The word of God sanctifies our life. And if it abides in our heart as truth, we will we'll live by that word and we'll die by that word. There's only one Bible to live by and die by. And that's the King James Bible. It's not a modern translation. 
In fact, I'll go ahead and say this. I would not die for a modern translation. I would take it and throw it in the fire. I would die for a King James Bible. I'm not giving up my King James Bible. Period. Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine my, my heart that I might not sin against thee. When the word of God is living in our hearts and ruling our lives, we're sanctified and set apart for Christ to do his work and to live for him a holy life and a clean life. Matthew 12, 35 says, A good man out of the treasure of his a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. You see, what's in the heart of man is going to come out. If it's good and righteous, it's going to come out. If it's evil and sinful, it's going to come out in his words and actions and deeds, whatever it might be. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. Paul writes, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Jesus said the good treasure in a man's heart is going to come out. If we've been saved, we got the treasure in our heart, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. And, and his life should come out in us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Do we let it shine for the world to see? Telling lost souls that Christ loves them and wants them to go to heaven when they die? We should. We need to. Matthew uh, 12, 37. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. The words we speak, what comes out of our mouth is what we believe. We can't hide what we believe because we say what we believe. A lost man is going to say what he believes. He's going to spout his filthy language and uh, whatever's on his mind that's wrong and evil. And a Christian ought to be proclaiming the righteousness and the holiness and the grace of Christ. You know, the words we speak, what comes out of our mouth is a mirror to our soul. What's inside you. What you speak is what is inside you. Your words would justify you by what you say. So the question is, is do my words line up with the word of God? Sometimes it's hard to comprehend that, that all the words we speak will be judged as truth or untruthfulness. Those things that we claim to speak for Jesus Christ are going to be examined one day at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul says in Romans 3, 4 again, God forbid, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest Overcome when thou art judged. My understanding of this verse is real simple. When a preacher or a man stands to speak the word of God, examine and see if he's teaching the word of God. Consider that man to be lying until the word of God shows he's telling the truth. If his words are true, then the word of God will be justified in his speech and when placed to next, next to God's word, we can examine those things he says and see if they are true. You know, a preacher, he's a human being, and sometimes he might say something pertaining to the word of God that might be wrong, that might have an error in it. That doesn't mean he's lying. It doesn't mean he's preaching false doctrine. Every man 
at times has quoted things they thought were right. But he's not lying in the sense that he's not making, he's not, he's not spouting a lie. He's, he's spouting a mistake he's made. And, we, and, and when he does, those that know the word of God need to go to him and explain to him, brother, this was misquoted. And if he's right with God, he'll accept your, your correction. Just because the guys are preaching don't mean he can't make a mistake. But, but the lie is this. It's when a preacher knows the truth and hides the truth and tells that lie anyway but for his own benefit and his own goal and purpose. And we got so many preachers today, preachers today that, that are spouting their lies for their own benefit to gain money or whatever, fame or fortune. We don't need preachers today who, who are preaching half-truths and that twist the scripture to their benefit for their plan or their false doctrine. There are too many half-truth preachers, lying preachers, deceiving the saints of God for worldly gain. So we need to examine their motive behind what they're doing and why they say the things they say. These preachers are wolves in the church and they've entered the ministry but they're full of darkness. They don't have any light in their heart. They've been to liberal Bible colleges that deny the word of God, deny the Bible. And they say that God's word is not preserved. And that's what they're being taught in a lot of the colleges today. Jude chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Jude writes, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was, needful, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, that's a license to sin, and denying the only God and our Savior, our, our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude says, earnestly contend for the faith. Now, we can make application of this for us today in the age of grace. I know Jude is right into those that are going to go through the tribulation, warning them how to live in the tribulation, but there's application here for us as well. He says, earnestly contend for the faith. That means do not compromise doctrine. Do not compromise truth. Don't change the word of God. Fight for the word of God. Don't let, don't let other men corrupt it in your, your, your church. If a man's corrupt in the word of God in your church, then either you've got to go or he's got to go. You know, Or he's got to change his heart and get right with God. In many churches today, heresy and lies are being taught and, and people are mixing law with grace. I think we covered it a while ago he said, where he said that, that uh, a lot of preachers say you've got to turn from your sin to be saved. Well, that's a work. That's not grace. You can't turn from your, your sin to be saved. You've got you to come to Christ as you are in your sin with your sin to be saved. And then you've got these preachers that, that spout, send me $500 and God's going to give you tenfold. Y'all believe that? If y'all believe that, then y'all give me $500. <laughs> I wouldn't take your money. I'm kidding, though. But, but that's true. I mean, you, you watch these guys on TV. You've seen them. They get on there and spout, send me a $1,000 seed plot, and God's going to bless you with $10,000. That's a lie from hell. They're, they're canker worms deceiving the flock, deceiving the church, fleecing dear old saints of God who are poor and can't hardly get by paying their bills every month. My grandmother, God rest her soul, she was a Pentecostal. She fell for that garbage when she was a living, and she would send sometime her last few dollars to those people. She never got nothing from them. They misused the scripture and twist it for their own benefit. They're lying to folks and 
deceiving them. There's no in between. It's either black, it's either black, no gray area, no white lie, but pure crystal truth. That's all it is. You either got a lie on one side or you got truth on the other side. Truth is very, very, very narrow. It's the point of the spear and the sword. The rest of the spear from the point down to the shaft is there to strengthen the point, to strengthen the truth. And the edge of that sword is to cut away lies and deceit and false doctrine and point you to the truth, the Word of God, the King James Bible. In some churches, the wolves don't even try to conceal their identity. They're open about their sin. They're open about their homosexual, sodomite relationships in the pulpit, from the pulpit. And I, don't even like, I don't even like to talk about this. I mean, it, it, it just makes you sick, my friend. It really does. The church, they try to make the church look like a nightclub or a rock concert. The preacher dresses like a rock star with that junk music playing in the background. They're deceiving people and send them to hell with their false doctrine. You know, we need a righteous anger, my friend, over this. I did learn one thing from the Independent Baptist, and that was a righteous anger. <laughs> I'm going to read Romans 1, <laughs> Romans 1, verse 20 through 32. And to be honest with you, my friend, if you, if you read these verses here, let these words speak to your heart. It's going to be hard to read if you read it with a right mind and a right heart. I mean, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling to me. Verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their own imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. <laughs> and changing the glory of God. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible beast. <laughs> I like corruptible man. I'm sorry my eyes are getting foggy here from this. <laughs> change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man, to birds and four footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, the dishonor of their own bodies between themselves. Changed the glory, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to the vile affections, for even the women did that which did, did change the natural use into that which was against nature. Folks, this is a picture of America today. It's an awful picture. Our country is on the way to hell. God's word condemns these sins.
and condemns those who take pleasure in those who do these sins. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the women burned in their lust one toward another men with men working that which is, unseem, is unseemly and receiving in themselves their recompense of their error which was meet. That means they received the reward of the punishment of their filthy sin that they deserved in the sight of God. And even as the day and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which was not convenient. <laughs> they didn't want God in their mind. They didn't want Christ in their heart. God turned them over to a reprobate mind because they were rejecting God and His holiness and His righteousness. Who know in the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do it. We need to pray for these folks, my friend, that are gripped in sin, this evil sin. We don't hate them. We're to love their souls and care for them. And that's hard for us to do. I understand that. We, we hate that sin, and we hate all sin. We hate people that kill and murder people. We hate that. But we need to learn as Christians to pray for those people who are held by the grip of Satan and hell. But as we look at these things, how can we even speak of these filthy sins that these, these people are doing today? How can we do it? It's so evil. It shocks the spirit of man. It shocks our conscience. If it doesn't shock your conscience, my friend, there's something wrong with your heart. If it doesn't stir your soul some way, it's something wrong. And yet in our day, we're seeing the destruction of morality in America on a scale we have Never thought possible. We don't even know what a woman is today. I mean, the Democrats can't describe, give you a, a testimony of what a woman is. We are sick, my friend. America's sick. And they're dying. And we're going to hell. And our churches, our churches are full today of candidates for the tribulation period. And that's a sad thought that our churches have failed to preach the gospel of grace of Christ. And all they're doing is bringing people in by the truckloads with this entertainment stuff. Building churches for the Antichrist using the modern translation that Satan's going to use in the tribulation period. And like I said earlier, no one will take my King James Bible from me. And you might say, well, I don't believe that. Well, I was a cop for 26 years, and I, I faced danger. I put my life on the line for people I didn't know, strangers. And I put my life on the line, and, and, I, and I had to fight for my life several times to stay alive. And you're telling me I won't die for a King James Bible? I'll die for a King James Bible, my friend. I will not die for a modern translation. Remember, Tyndale said that God's word is full of grace and truth. So today we need to learn grace and truth and live by grace and truth. And I want to end on a positive note instead of a negative note. <laughs> We've been too negative this morning. The Philippian jailer was had Paul and Silas in jail, and God opened the doors, broke the prison walls down, and opened the doors, and the jailer was going to kill himself. Paul said, do thyself no harm. And then the jailer said to Paul, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Great verse of scriptures. For by grace you get saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you're here this morning and you have never been saved and never trusted Christ as your Savior, you don't have to walk a church aisle. You don't have to say a sinner's prayer. 
All you have to do is do like that Philippians jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that Jesus Christ went to the cross and shed His blood for you and died for you and was buried for you and rose again the third day. Put your trust and in, in, in all your soul in that and that alone. And God will save you right where you are right now if you will do that. So we're going to have a word of prayer. And then we'll close today. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning realizing, Lord, that we are frail human beings and that our bodies are weak, but you're strong, Lord. And we know, Lord, that you hold us in the grip of your hand and that we're held by the grace of God. And, Lord, we do ask and pray, Lord, if there's one here today that knows not Christ as a Savior, that they would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus, Lord, by simply believing in what Christ did and resting in what Christ did on the cross and nothing else. Not trying to earn their way to heaven, not trying to do good works or good deeds, but simply put their trust in the crucified, risen Lord. Lord, I pray now that you'd bless each person here today, watch over us throughout the week, help us to be better Christians. In Christ's name we pray, amen.